Hello, everyone, and welcome to question hour 13, our live Q&A session with Mr. Sunil Subramaniam, MD of Sundaram Mutual. We'll answer questions you have on the economy, stock markets, and mutual funds, and other investments as well. Thank you for joining us, sir. We've already received several questions for you to answer, so shall we get started? Sure. Thank you, all of you, for the overwhelming response. I have a huge bunch of questions. We'll try and answer as many of them in the next one hour as possible. Please go ahead, Sweta. The first question, sir. What is the future of the Indian economy in this pandemic situation? Can we hope the economy will grow and GDP maybe around 7 to 10%? Uh, I think that you can remain uh, uh, optimistic about the Indian economy's future. In the short term, pandemic, uh, more than the pandemic, it's the lockdowns which you uh, put to control the pandemic which affects the economy. And as we have seen, compared to the first wave and the second wave, uh, we did a much better job of controlling it quickly. And the lockdowns were lifted fairly quickly. We have to remain vigilant. There could be a Delta wave, a third wave coming up. Vaccinations are also uh, picking up. So I think that any short-term impact on the economy, I think you can be confident that the Indian economy is resilient enough to absorb it and take it forward. And you need more proof for this is the fact that foreigners continue to invest in India, not just the stock market-related FPI flows, but you have achieved record FDI flows, which is direct money coming in either in the form of private equity into uh, you know startups or in the form of factories being set up post the PLI scheme. So I think you can remain confident about the Indian economy. And I think this year we may end up with uh, maybe a nine, nine and a half percent GDP growth. But next year, because we will not have the favorable base effect of the previous year, seven to seven and a half percent as a long run growth rate for India for the next two to three years is, I think, reasonably achievable. So I think you can remain optimistic about the Indian economy. The next question, sir. How can we beat the present inflation situation? I think the present inflation situation is a temporary uh, uh, jump in inflation because certain commodity prices have risen, uh, oil prices rose recently, metal prices rose recently. So there's an imported inflation component. Uh, monsoon has been fairly good. And if it sustains, the domestic supply side inflation should be under control because food supply will mean that food inflation will not affect core inflation. And on the other part of the inflation, which is the demand side inflation, the economy is just recovering from the second wave. So we don't expect any great pull on inflation. So I think the reasonably the current levels of inflation are probably within RBI's comfort zone. And I think for equity markets to achieve a inflation beating return is not going to be a challenge at all this year. In fact, I would expect you to get a good alpha over inflation in the coming year. The next question, sir. Will the rupee get stronger against the US dollar? So the trend line of the rupee uh, is that it's not just about how the rupee and our country behaves. It's also about how the dollar behaves. So the rupee so far has got strong because of two reasons. One is a weakening dollar because of the American fiscal deficit and the current account deficit. The twin deficits in America have made the dollar weak because America has become weaker because of the deficits. So the weakening dollar supported by the fact that monetary flows like FDI flows and FPI flows, which I just mentioned, have flown in. So RBI is forced to buy those dollars to sterilize the rupee. So we have built up a $600 billion surplus, right? So that has also helped the rupee to be strong. Now, going forward, both these factors, so you can expect a continuance of FDI flows to India because of the PLI scheme and others. You can expect that the FPI flows will be up and down because if the world is recovering, you'll expect less emerging market flows and more back to the advanced country flows. And the second thing is India may lose some amount of FPI flows to other emerging countries as they play catch up as a commodity cycle revives. So there will be a balancing factor between the two. And the third factor here is what does RBI do with this chest, right? So if the rupee starts to weaken, how will RBI use it to control? So there, please bear in mind that the PLI scheme is essentially an export-oriented scheme. So as the world economy recovers, India should try to grab a larger and larger share of the world export pie. And for that, a rupee has to be relatively weak. It cannot become strong because then it hurts the competitive pricing for our exports. So I would say that in my summation of all that I said, I don't expect the rupee to get much, much stronger. 
I think a stable rupee with a slight weakening trend is the one which is best for our country and is one which RBI will also allow a gradual weakening of the rupee. So I think we'd rather be better prepared for a weaker rupee than for a stronger rupee. That's my uh, humble opinion. We have another one on inflation, sir. How will this impact interest rates in the next year? So interest rates, I think, are slated to uh, rise in the next year because not only is the inflation component that you spoke about, but also the demand side, because as the economy revives, there'll be need for credit. So as the need for credit arises, then corporates will be willing to pay higher and higher interest rates. So the market interest rates will reset at higher levels. So I do expect that next year interest rates will be higher than this year. So there'll be a rising trend of interest rates. The next one, sir. Is it the right time to invest in the markets now? See, it's never a wrong time to invest in the markets. The only thing is the time frame. Now, the markets have risen very strongly post the pandemic. So if you're having a six months, 12 months kind of a view, then there could be volatility and there could be the tapering related questions, how fast the American economy recovers. So a shorter term view is always a high risk view. But the moment you take a view, which is like, say, three to five year period, the whatever be the valuations, remember, they are a function of the earnings EPS growth of the companies in the stock market, right? So when the valuations are high, it means that the expectation of EPS growth is high. As long as the Indian economy recovers and that EPS gets justified, these valuations will look reasonable. So if you have a long enough time frame, then I would say that uh, there is never a wrong time to invest in the market. The second issue is, how do you then invest? Do you put all your money at one go or do you stagger it? So when you anticipate volatility, it is always better to stagger it. So SIPs, STPs, these are very good methodologies to adopt in the current scenario. So I would say, yes, continue to invest, but choose a more suitable investment strategy, which is SIPs, STPs over the next 12 to 18 months, so that you get the advantage of the volatility, but in three to five years, you will make very good returns. So I would say continue to invest, continue to stay invested. The next question, sir. Markets are at an all-time high, but is this bull rally sustainable? Should we book profits in PMS and mutual funds? So markets are at an all-time high because expectations are at an all-time high and liquidity is at an all-time high. So from your perspective, whether to book profits, you see, if you have need for your money in the next 18 months, then I would suggest you book profits, right? If you don't need your money, and you're a long-term investor and you're only looking for the very long-term, which is five years plus, then you don't need to worry about the current valuations or the market being all-time high. The market will continuously reach all-time highs as long as the economy grows. So reaching all-time highs is not critical. What is critical is that it's also all-time high valuation. And that's where I said that you adopt a strategy of uh, staggered investment. So if you need money in the next 18 months, I would say, yes, you should book your profits and park it in a safer investment avenue. What is a safer investment avenue? Uh, liquid funds are one. But if you need it in one year's time, then liquid funds could hurt you on taxation because debt funds need a three-year investment. So there is one uh, uh, type of fund which is ideally suited for this situation that is called the equity savings fund. Now, the equity savings fund is actually 70-75% non-equity exposure, either through arbitrage or through debt. But it gives you equity taxation because arbitrage is considered as equities for the purpose of taxation. So equity savings funds, if you hold on for one year, you get the long-term capital gains taxation of equity, which is only 10%. And the first one lakh is tax-free. So it's an excellent choice in the current, that if you need money over the next one year, I would say park it in an equity savings fund. And let's say that you need it in nine months. Even then, short-term capital gains tax is only 15%. It's still the best tax-efficient alternative of all the funds in the market. So I would strongly urge you all to look at equity savings funds to book when you book your profits to park it there. The next question, sir. What is your impression on small and mid-cap segment under such a volatile situation? Should we invest in these or book profits if we have any? 
So the answer is not very different from the previous question, right? If you need money in the next 12 to 18 months, then you can book profits. Yes, mid and small caps have rallied a lot. But I will also tell you that the reason for that rally is the strong expectation of a very strong domestic recovery post the pandemic, right? So when that recovery plays out, I would believe that even these valuations are reasonable and they're a good time to invest. But the domestic story always takes time to play out. So you have to have be patient. So in the mid and small cap, I would say definitely today you should have a five-year outlook, right? And definitely your investment will pay rich dividends. But please do not look at your portfolio in the middle and start worrying about it. Second is that the SIP, STP strategy is even more suitable to mid and small cap because they're even more inherently volatile, which means you get a lot of ups and downs. So as long as you stagger it, you get the full benefit of rupee cost averaging. So my uh, same philosophy that I laid out in the earlier answer continues, but I would say even more an SIP, STP route and even longer a time frame. The next one, sir. What is your outlook on these three sectors, chemicals, IT, and pharma? So I'm bullish on all the three sectors, uh, partly because what I said some time back that rupee, I believe, is going to uh, devalue. Right? If rupee is going to weaken, these are all export-oriented sectors, they will all benefit, number one. Number two is a reviving world, will mean more demand and more opportunities for India to export. So chemicals and uh, pharma are two places where we can substitute China to some extent in terms of filling up that gap. IT India has always been strong, but I believe that there's a fundamental reset to the IT because of the pandemic, which augurs very well for the Indian IT companies. So all these three sectors, I think I'm reasonably uh, optimistic on and overweight on, and I would suggest that they are good sectors to allocate for an aggressive investor. Remember, being sectoral allocations, they are also inherently more volatile than normal diversified uh, uh, mutual funds. The next one, sir. What is your investment strategy at the current market levels and economic conditions? When you say my uh, investment strategy, uh, I presume you're talking about uh, Sundaram Mutual Fund. Uh, Sundaram Mutual Fund has always uh, remained a uh, India-oriented uh, bullish strategy. And we remain confident about India's prospects. And I think all our fund allocations reflect that. The next one, sir. Uh, what about Sundaram Midcap Fund's performance? So Sundaram Midcap Fund has been one that has uh, bet very heavily on India, bet heavily, very heavily on the smaller cap. So even within midcaps, it is a smaller midcaps, and it also had about 20-25% small caps in its portfolio. So very close to the ground, India-specific, which over the last few years has not helped it because it's been the foreigners coming to play and the safety and not the growth part of the Indian economy, which has come into play. So the fund has suffered relative to its peers, relative to the benchmark because of this polarization. But over the next three to five years, as the Indian economy dominates the, the investment thesis, the mid-cap fund will definitely become an outperformer once again. And I would suggest that it's a very strong candidate for continuing SIP allocations uh, for this fund. It will deliver good returns in the medium term. The next one, sir. Uh, when will FIIs move out from the market? So FIIs will move out on three conditions. One is that uh, if a third wave hits India very badly and our vaccination is not picked up, and so the prospects of the Indian economy uh, get delayed in terms of when it will all come into play is one reason for FIS to worry. Because these valuations have already factored a sharp V-shaped recovery. So if that recovery is going to get delayed, then the valuations will look very rich and overvalued. That's one reason. Second is that if America comes back to growth path, that means that inflation will rise in America. And it also means that uh, interest rates will rise. So hedge funds, which borrow money from bankers that in invested markets like India, their cost of borrowing will go up. So their margins will shrink. So they will then be more hyper in terms of which country to allocate to. So that's one thing. Plus, some of them will move their money back into American bonds and American equities. So that's the second risk from FIS. The third risk is that this America-led revival, and if China continues a growth path very strongly, then commodities are likely to continue to rise. They've already risen, they're in the pause, but they could rise in the next level. So if that happens, then for an FBI, India is a commodity importing country. Brazil, Russia are commodity exporting countries. So he would say that if commodity prices rise, Indian EPS companies, EPS is going to get crunched because of the 
input cost going up whereas a brazil and a brazilian company and a russian company would get an increasing top line because of rising commodity prices so he will within the emerging market market reallocate to the commodity exporters vis-a-vis -vis the commodity importer like india so these are the three risk factors from an fpis perspective that you need to be aware of and be cognizant to judge whether fpis are going to be pulling money out or putting money in the next question sir i uh, moved all my mutual fund investments into a liquid fund as i felt there was no uh, new measures from the government should i proceed to reinvest in other funds i would suggest that you do the stp route if you put it in a liquid fund i would take a 18 month stp and start allocating into this based on your risk profile you can choose the kind of funds the next one sir now that the pe of indices is high what do you expect in the future price correction earnings moving upwards or something else i think it's a combination of all so for me uh, uh, the growth uh, oriented uh, expectations of eps growth right for the growth sectors i think is still uh, undervalued because i think the indian growth when it bounces back can far beat these expectations whereas on the safety oriented play the fear factor which has led to increasing money going into safety oriented plays will mean that there could be corrections in the safety oriented plays so i would say there'll be a mix of both happening in the future so stay diversified is the best option which funds do you think will do good in the next 3 to 5 years so so i think that uh, uh, in the next 3 to 5 years i would say that uh, services sector oriented funds would do well because that's the one which got hurt in the pandemic that's the one which will bounce back with a v shaped recovery so that's one uh, which i expect to do because a lot of ipos are also coming into services related play all your fintechs all your uh, zomatos all of those in the services sector so i think that's one which with increasing penetration of the capital markets is going to do well the second one with the uh, in the bend of medium term outlook if you keep it to 5 years is the infrastructure sector because i believe the indian economy's growth is ultimately going to be from a keynesian model of capital entering the country and the government and others pumping it up pump priming the economy so it's a infra route to growth that's going to come through in india so infrastructure i believe is a good segment to invest the third sector which i believe will continuously do well is the banking and financial services space it's a very wide space you have public sector banks private sector banks you have the top quality nbfcs you have microfinance institutions you have small finance banks you have payment banks and then you have the asset management companies you have insurance companies so there's wealth management so there's a whole variety of play in the banking and financial services play which all are going to benefit in the indian economic recovery so i would say that that's another sector which will do well the next question sir i want to invest a lump sum in mutual fund and i am expecting monthly quarterly half yearly returns is that possible if it no. is can you Um, I would say that that's not possible. See, there are funds like balanced funds, which is the aggressive hybrids, which have been giving monthly dividends based on their profits. As long as the profits are there, they will continue. But inherently, the equity market is a very volatile place. So to expect monthly, quarterly returns from the equity markets, I think is unrealistic and unreasonable, and you will at times be disappointed. So I would suggest that the equity market is a place for long-term wealth creation and not for income generation. Income generation is best done to fixed deposits, and there are mutual funds which give regular dividend payouts, right? With the longer-term track record, you can park it, but be prepared for any negative surprises if the markets go through a long correction. So I would say that uh, the purpose of the equity market is not to generate regular income; it is to generate long-term. wealth creation in excess of inflation so with those goals in mind i would suggest you look at your portfolio the next question sir um i'm an investor in your global brand fund is there a way to see its monthly portfolio and going forward what's the road map for the global brand fund will it do better than domestic funds in the next 3 to 5 years so i would say that you can portfolio you can come to our website and our uh, fact sheets are displayed monthly the portfolio will be available but i must caution you that the global brand fund essentially changes its portfolio only once a year in january happens in the month of october when the, all the brand ranking comes if you are familiar with the fund it chooses the top 30 brands of the world to invest in so this brand rankings only change once a year so when those rankings change is when the portfolio gets changed otherwise month on month the portfolio doesn't change so there's uh, no need to worry about looking at it month on month 
I think uh, the month of October, November, every year, if you look at it, you'll know the new portfolio. That's number one. On whether it's going to uh, beat the domestic funds is a function of the devaluation of the rupee. I think the devaluation rupee, which I strongly expect, will definitely help it deliver good returns. But it also means that the revival of the world economy, because all these are global brands. So brands revive when economy revives, because people spend more on Coca-Cola, on, on Google, on Apple, on everything, when their personal incomes go up. So I think a recovering world, right, will mean there'll be lots of parts of the world which will grow better than India, and this fund can benefit from that. But then it diversifies. So I would say that look at it as a complement to your domestic mutual fund and not a substitute for your domestic mutual fund. That's the way I would ask you to encourage you to look at this. The next question, sir. I've invested in Sumaram Services Fund from um, July 2019 uh, with an SIP. Now the Sensex is high, so should I book profits or continue this SIP? No, you can continue the SIP. There's no need to book profits from an SIP because SIP over the long run is supposed to deliver the capital creation. By breaking the SIP, you're going to lose out on that. So I would suggest, as I said a uh, couple of questions before, the services sector is poised to grow in the capital markets very strongly, and this fund is also slated to capture that growth. So I would suggest continue your SIP. There's no need to book profits. The next one, sir. Can I invest a lump sum of about 2 lakhs in Sundaram Blue Chip Fund at this time? I would say that uh, split it 50-50, 50% you put in lump sum, 50% you stagger as a 12-month STP in the large cap fund. The next one, sir. Uh, dividends on uh, Sundaram Equity Fund, uh, when would you declare? So I think that uh, we just uh, waiting because it's a multi-cap portfolio, right? So it's got 25% small cap, 25% mid cap, and about 50% large cap. Let's say we rule its following. So I think we'd like the corpus to build up quite healthily, right? And then declare a dividend. So maybe you can look forward to it in the second half of this year. The next question, sir. Is now a good time for a lump sum in the services fund? So I would suggest that uh, any lump sum investment at this time is a little bit high risk because the markets are at a valuation stage where any news about tapering will create a big hangama here. Any third wave coming up could create. So markets, while they're well valued and risen a lot, right? It's a, it's a time when I would say lump sums in large caps, like I said, 50% you can put. But any other fund, services is a multi-cap fund. So I would suggest that a staggering approach, you know, you can choose it six months, 12 months, 18 months, according to your risk appetite. But a staggered approach would be better served at this point of time than a lump sum approach in a multi-cap kind of a category. The next question, sir. What is the update on the principal mutual fund acquisition for Sundaram Mutual? So we are answering questions. We have approved from the control, uh, the Competition Commission of India, CCI. We are awaiting SEBI approval. The number of questions, uh, it is an active discussion with SEBI. The questions are coming through every day and we are responding. So we expect that in the by the by maybe this quarter, right end of this quarter, we should hopefully uh, have the approval, and then we'll uh, you know do the formalities. The next one, sir. What's your opinion on the recent increase in bank fixed deposit insurance? So that's actually uh, you know if you look at it, the government has never allowed a bank to fail. So this insurance bill is actually meant to allow the government to allow the bank to fail. So this, earlier it was one lakh, it has become five lakhs. It is the government's way of saying, I am going to protect 95% or 99% as the case may be of the number of people investing in banks so that I don't need to bail out, merge, or do something to uh, a bad bank, right? So this actually means that people will end up spreading their investments at not more than 5 lakhs per bank. So if you have a crore, you'll go and choose 20 banks to do it. So then you are getting protected by the statute and not by a government's choice, right? Now it's a very sensitive topic. This is the step one, that ultimately a government will then allow a bank to fail. Remember that. So I would say that while this is good from the perspective of the country, right? Because the burden on the government to bail out every bank, it's also not a healthy uh, president. It's good for the economy, 
but as an investor you should be cautious that in the future any investments beyond 5 lakhs you may end up losing your money even in a bank fixed deposit if the bank fails because government will not come and bail it out that is the intention long term intention of this step the next question so why no passives from your fund house yet many customers are investing now we do have a passive we have a something called a nifty equal weighted fund so you can look at it it's there available for subscription more and more passive funds uh, for us to launch well we are strong believers of alpha the last one year was an aberration because the corona virus pandemic made a lot of polarized money enter into specific uh, stocks and so mutual fund managers struggle to beat the benchmark so people looked at passive and throw is passive giving a better return we believe it's a passing phase it's a passing fancy for passives from the retail investor base yes institutions and high net worth individuals will always look at that cost differential and look at it but we believe that sundaram as a fund house is a strong believer of alpha that research plus diversification can deliver you better risk weighted returns and hence from our perspective passes as a growth strategy right uh, we are not about to go and get listed that we need to build up our aum to do anything we have no desire to grow our assets without unless we add value to the customers in a passive as a fund house how can we add value it's the markets right so we will be there. i will never say never we already have one passive fund we will launch specific strategic options on the passive space as and when opportunities arise but otherwise we are not looking at building a huge passive book because we believe that our brains and our hard work should reflect in an alpha over the benchmark to the investors and our effort is to constantly strive to do that and make the investor a happier investor and a wiser investor the next one sir why does sundaram global brand fund have a low aum despite its long track record that's because you know we chose not to launch it as an nfo i think if you see when you launch as an nfo at 10 rupees people get very fancy and everybody goes and puts money but we already had a global uh, advantage fund which was very different but it was already there in shell so we just chose to put it to change the shell and put it so because of that you know we didn't go and launch a big marketing campaign around an nfo i'm sure if you had done that that fund would have raised 1000 crores plus easily given the quality of the fund so we have deliberately chosen it not to do it as an nfo but to let the track record speak and build up so we are optimistic that over a period of time people will realize the value and it will grow the fact that it has not grown as much as any other fund is not worrying us because we believe people will realize the true value when they look at it so i think that the only reason it hasn't built scale is because we didn't choose to launch it as an nfo there's no other reason for it the next one sir um why are fii selling indian equities well i i just explained that right so there's a some set of fii which is fearing tapering happening which is fearing a rise in interest rates and hence pulling back money from wherever they have made huge profits so second reason is that they have made huge profits from the indian market so sometimes it's good to generate the cash like i was telling for an investor if his goal is achieved for the next 18 months to book it now similarly fpi has also come with specific goals in mind so they have to return money to their investors where they have collected it they would like to give a good return and book profits third is that their apprehension that as the world economy recovers commodity cycle going up will mean commodity exporting countries are a better position to play so some fis have shifting allocation from a commodity importing country to a commodity exporting country so it's a part of the normal uh, ebb and flow of uh, capital so this is not something that i am unduly worried about it is just reallocation among various markets the next one sir do you suggest parking liquid capital in f bank fds considering the low return from liquid funds uh not really so if you stay invested in a liquid fund for 3 years and take the post tax yield i'm sure that even today it will compare february with the post tax yield of a bank fixed deposits if you are not a tax paying person then what you say is perhaps true but if you are a tax payer and you do the mathematics right and look at the bank fd and take the marginal taxation that you will pay and deduct it from the rate of return and look at a 3 year holding of even a liquid fund and look at the daily compounding that the return will give you and then the indexation based taxation which you will get on the long term 
you will still find that even liquid funds are fairly competitive to bank FDs, but any short-term fund should be able to beat FDs over a three-year time frame reasonably comfortably. The next one, sir. I see Paytm and Grow selling Sundra Mutual schemes aggressively, sir. Are you supporting direct plans now? Not really. Uh, from our perspective, anybody is free to sell. So Paytm and Grow are, uh, you know, they are RIAs, Registered Investment Advisors. They choose our funds based on their study of our funds. We don't pay them any money. We don't do anything special. It is just that we have enabled the backend processing very smoothly, seamlessly with their platforms, with the help of our registrar. So I think that ease of uh, transaction, plus the fact that our performance stands out in many of our funds, like our services sector fund being the unique one, is one of the, you know, there is an option only with Sundaram. So an investor cannot go anywhere else if he wants to invest in the services sector. So these kind of factors, the global brand fund, again, is a unique fund. So these are the factors which are helping the money to come. So when they say that they are pushing aggressively, I think they also use a very systematic performance and outlook-based approach to put a fund on the recommended list. And it is that process which is throwing up some of the Sundaram funds there. So it's not that Sundaram has a very active direct uh, access. No, we've always been a fund house which believes that advice and distribution support are critical for an investor that do-it-yourself kind of a thing is not very suitable to the mutual fund industry because do-it-yourself people tend to look at past returns and then just invest, which is not necessarily the best way to invest. You've got to have a sense of your goals, financial planning towards that, and a sense of what funds can do well in the future as opposed to what fund has done well in the past. That is where an advisor come, you know, distribution support person, right, or MFT, can be of great value to investors and they can also look at it. If by pushing direct, I'm gonna watch only my fund house, but is my fund house's funds the best for all times and for all kinds of investor needs? Definitely not. So having a blend of fund houses is, 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 a, is a good option, which any advisor, stroke distribution support person can help you with. So direct is definitely not something that we are aggressively targeting. Uh, in the past, not have we done, not in the future. The next question, sir. Retail investors are gung-ho on small caps. Is it a good time to start being fearful about small caps? See, uh, so on specific stocks, yes. But which stocks? See, because you can figure it out, right? Stocks which are at the 52-week, why? So the point is that even within a small cap portfolio, diversification is important, one. Even within a small cap portfolio, quality is important, corporate governance and all that. Even within a small cap portfolio, you got to look at the future of the Indian economy and who's going to grow with that. So I would still say that a small cap fund is a far better option. And in retail investors, we'll always point out that one victory, the one multi-bagger and talk about his successes. But for every multi-bagger, there will be 10 stocks which have underperformed. So I would say that uh, individual stock investing based on tips from various people, yes, it's a time to be fearful. But to invest in a diversified small cap fund of a reputed fund house using an SIP approach, I think is the best. The next question, sir. When is Sundaram Mutual launching a flexi cap NFO? So, uh, well, uh, right now for me, the most important thing is to get an approval for the principal and integrate the principal schemes with us post which is where we will look at any new fund offerings. The next question. So do you see Sundram AMC getting listed in the near future after seeing the successful listing of other AMCs and favorable valuation of AMCs in the Indian equity market? No, no we don't see that as an option. The next question. So would you recommend investments in ETFs? So I, I see... Uh, uh, it's basically like this, right? Uh, ETFs save you cost and they give you the market return, right? Now, if you feel that a market return is good enough for you, then ETFs are the best bet. Now, fund managers are paid salaries and uh, asset management fees to beat the benchmark, which is equal to the ETFs. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. But if you take a long-term track record, 
I believe that they will succeed enough so that whatever extra cost you pay through asset management fees will more than be compensated by the higher return you get, right? So certain specific fund managers and certain specific fund houses schemes may not beat the benchmarks. Their ETFs will look better. But in the absence of that, I would say that any ETF, right? If you take now a Nifty ETF, is 50 stocks. Is India's growth story limited to 50 stocks? Certainly not. So I would argue that India is a much wider economy, much better, and there are chances for fund managers over the long run to find good companies which are not in the index, which can deliver good returns, right? So that backing that ability, just this short term, since the corona epidemic is where we have had this situation of fund managers not being able to benchmark and suddenly ETFs are. ETFs are ideal vehicles for large institutions like Provident Funds or HNIs who are very cost conscious and who don't want to be accused of favoring one fund house over another in their choice. So the ETF takes away that risk. So to that extent, where they are investing thousands of crores, even a small change in WIPs can make a difference to the profitability. So for them, it's suitable. For a retail investor, right? I would say that uh, if you've done a, chosen a diversified pack of mutual funds within which there's a diversified portfolio of stocks, right? I would argue that that portfolio would beat over a medium term any ETFs. So to me, for a retail investor to be worried about that small one or two percent cost and say that, oh, for my one lakh rupees, I'm saving this money, the time and effort you spend in allocating to various ETFs, deciding on the asset allocation, all of that is also a cost to you. It, you know, in rupees and as in price, it will come down somewhere because you could do something else with your time. So I would suggest that if you use an advisor distributor, choose a set of select mutual fund schemes, arguably that cost which is inherent in the actively managed schemes will ultimately help you deliver a better return than a broader market, which is what an ETF will represent. So my advice to retail investors is not to get carried away by the short term, last one, one and a half, two years, ETFs outperforming active funds to be make that as the core method to do that. Now, that being said, Every retail investor can put small amount in ETF because that's the best way to judge your fund manager. Because each fund manager will choose different benchmark and say, I beat this, I beat that. So for you, the broader market. So keep a small allocation to ETF so that that's always your lighthouse. That's your guiding principle. Okay, this is what the market delivered. Has my choice of funds done it? Because then when you reevaluate your funds, you can look at it and say, hey, why did this guy not beat the benchmark? So can I look at it? Is it bad fund performance? Is it bad quality? Or what is the reason? And then make, make your asset allocation changes according to that. The next one, sir. Why was the dividend uh, option renamed as IDCW? What made this redefinition? Uh, Sabi made this redefinition. What is the reason for that? Is because, see, technically a company pays dividend from profits. So a mutual fund when it pays dividend should pay from profits. What is the profit? Increase in NAV. From now, what is the issue there? is that every investor arrives at different points in time. So a person who came with NFO at 10 rupees will always be in profit as long as the NAV is about 10. But a person who came yesterday and today dividends declared today, how can you say that he has made profit to declare? Now, the task of identifying which investors and each investor level profit and then decide to declare a dividend or not is a very onerous task. Now, so then Sebi said that, look, but people are thinking that when they get a dividend, they're getting it from profits. And Sebi's rules prescribe. But I said it can't be for each individual investor. It's at a scheme level aggregate that the profits are used to pay the old word dividend. So then Sebi said, okay, let us be fair in communicating to the investor of that dividend declared, right? How much is profit and how much is his own capital coming back? Then an investor can make a very judgment to say, oh, out of my 10 rupees dividend, 8 rupees was my capital coming back, only 2 rupees was profit. That So that is why now it's called that IDCW, right? Income distribution, capital withdrawal. So I think it is something where I would say it is for transparency. It is to clearly communicate to the investor that just because you're getting this money, which was called a dividend, it doesn't mean it's your capital market profits. There's a proportion of profits and a proportion, and that proportion could vary from time to time. So please be aware, this is what you're getting. So I think that is the reason for the same. And it helps from a taxation perspective because only that dividend income is then taxed at your hand from an income tax perspective, right? Not 
the capital withdrawal because the capital withdrawal is then again only if there's profit it's gone as profit so i think it also helps from a taxation perspective though the tax deduction at source may happen because of the rules you can file a return and claim the tax benefit for the income distribution part only so i think that's the reason this change occurred it's a change for the good because like i said in the case of mutual funds the dividends are not for every investor coming out of profits so that's why this transparency was very critical to tell to the investor what is it that the money that came back to you what what was it was it your own money coming back or was it profits coming back the next one sir are mutual funds open to creating a portfolio of next gen companies not really because uh, next gen companies have to get listed so mutual funds uh, are essentially meant to invest in listed companies and uh, only next gen yes i think there are fund houses which have said we'll do only new ipos do that that they can do but i think that the mutual funds reason for existence is to diversify it doesn't mean that only next gen will do well right so it's like a sector next gen is like a sector so i would say diversification is more the reason mutual funds exist right than going and choosing only the winners there are portfolio management services pms which can do what you say but mutual funds as a vehicle is meant to reduce the risk of investing without losing equal amount of reward the next one sir can sundaram mutual funds be purchased online of direct growth options in nfo if so how so i think that uh, you know right now we don't have any nfo plans whenever nfo comes yes you can come to the website you can go to various online platforms and purchase it through the direct option yes even in our regular schemes you can purchase it through online platform not just during nfo any time you can buy the next one sir is nifty 50 index mutual fund better or an index equal weightage fund better any cons in either please advise so uh, a nifty 50 index and a equal weight index what it does is that a equal weight index does 2% in every stock so that 50 stocks into 2% is 100% right now when the nifty 50 appreciates it could be that the specific stocks have risen much more than some other stocks so that elevation will come to the nifty 50 whereas in the case of the equal weighted index every stocks appreciation will be divided by that 50 because then only you will get to that so when there are times when the market is continuously rising the nifty 50 index will beat the equal weighted index but at times when the market rises and falls in a volatile time the equal weightage means that it's like an sip what happens with equal weight is that that which has fallen you still buy 2% of that that which has risen also you buy 2% so that which fell has a greater probability of rise over a period of time so that the nifty 50 in a volatile scenario will outperform the equal weighted index will outperform the nifty 50 index so unfortunately we cannot predict whether how much volatility is there to guarantee that so putting some money into the nifty 50 some money into the equal weight will give you the best of both worlds the next one sir i have invested 2 crore in sundaram short term debt fund 4 years ago but due to dhfl problem the growth of this fund is affected when will this problem be solved and uh, will i be able to get back my money with reasonable growth so first thing is that uh, today the worst case scenario has already been taken by the fund which is it has written off the dhfl exposure so today's nav reflects a worst case situation so from here on now you are there in the papers you are reading about the developments on dhfl right so your guess is as good as then when the court case will end and the matter get resolved but one thing is guaranteed is that nobody is ever going to get full money that they invested back that is the mutual funds which invested there is going to be a haircut of some sort right what it is will the time will tell so because of that from today's nav right you will get a a, a good return because whatever money you get is a plus but for your old money which you put definitely there is a correction but that correction has already been 100% written down so the best way to profit from that is to put an sip into that same fund because then the new money is going to come at a discounted nav which means you're going to get more units so do an sip in the same fund today and then when the restoration of the dhfl whenever that happens right this new money would give you a very good return because that money will come in then and then offset the loss on your old money so i would say doing an averaging because i think one thing is fairly clear is that the there's an advanced stage of progress on the dhfl matter so sooner or later there will be a resolution but like i said in the resolution there will be a haircut for everybody 
So your old money is definitely going to take a hit vis-a-vis -vis the capital. So getting back that capital fully is going to be a challenge. The only way out is if you average it out now, so that as and when a future date that resolution happens, this new money has earned you some amount of that loss back. So that my strategy would be in that. The next question, sir. Could you please explain the difference between direct funds and regular funds in MFs? Yes. So uh, there's an expense ratio charge for managing a fund by the asset management company. Then that expense ratio is divided into two, right? It is one is the earning of the AMC. Second is what we pay as a commission to distributors who uh, help distribute the fund to investors, right? So what this does is that the direct plan charges you only the asset management fees of the AMC as a cost. The regular plan charges you the asset management fees of the AMC plus the weighted average distribution cost that the company is incurring in helping to market the fund. So regular plan investments, right, carry that additional cost of the commission that is overall paid. Hence, direct plan NAVs are always at a slightly higher than a regular plan NAV because of this. But then that cost which is being paid, it is up to the investor to make good use of it by having a good chat with your distributor, helping him to draw up a financial plan, setting your goals and doing that. So I think that cost is worth it in the long run because the right allocation, which only a distributor can help you with, will ultimately deliver you better returns than just pure fund performance. So I think the asset allocation makes the financial planning and all of that are services for which the distributor is paid a commission. And I think over a long term, it will be worth its weight in gold. So it's ultimately your choice. If you feel that you have the skills and the capability to do your own asset allocation, choose the right funds, then a direct plan is obviously going to save you that distribution cost. The next question, sir. Is now the right time to invest in large cap mutual funds? How should we go about it? SRP or lump sum? So I would say large caps are always a safer bet compared to broader market or mid caps and small caps. So today, large caps have been on a good journey because of the FII's putting the market, right? So when a day comes when the FII's pull out money, the large caps will get affected, but there'll be a domino effect on the small and mid cap also. So just when the FII's pull out, though they're not pulling out from small and mid cap, the market sentiment, oh, market is correcting, so let me book profits from small cap and mid cap by those who have invested, leads to a domino effect. So the small caps and mid caps fall more than the large caps, though the actual news flow is, liquidity flow is for the large caps. So large caps are that which doesn't rise as much as small cap and mid cap when there's a boom, but doesn't fall as much when there is a correction in the uh, uh, bear market. So large caps are an essential part of your portfolio. But it shouldn't be the only part of your portfolio because if things times are good, you're going to get a lesser return. If you see since the corona epidemic, you have seen that small caps are done better than mid caps, mid caps are done better than large caps. But at the same time, when you look at the previous cycle from say December 2017 to the corona epidemic, large caps lost you less money than mid caps and small caps. So having a component of large caps in your portfolio is critical, but they shouldn't be 100% of your portfolio, number one. Your question on whether SIP or lump sum, the point is that I would suggest SIP at this stage because there is this proximate threat of a tapering and which could lead to volatility. So anytime there is volatility, an SIP is a better investment vehicle than a lump sum. So for the coming 12, 18 months, I would say SIP should be your chosen route of vehicle or an STP, parking it in a liquid fund and shifting it into equity over a pickup time. The next question, sir. Uh, what are the growth prospects of the industrial segment? Which are the leading stocks? So I'm sorry, I cannot comment about stocks. Sevi does not permit us to talk stock specific answers. But on the industrial segment as a whole, uh, I think it's uh, essentially the revival of two things. Uh, one is the infrastructure growth driven by government spend, which this year is going to be short of expectations because efforts have been diverted to the corona epidemic and foreigners coming in and creating infrastructure in India, uh, which is where the PLI scheme is supporting it. So industrials are a function of that. The third aspect where it helps out is the industrials will benefit is when export oriented picks up. So in order to 
substitute that exports support that exports you need to have capacities created so again manufacturing will come in so manufacturing capacity utilization is critical for this now india's capacity utilization today is an all time low and just begun to recover so as it recovery happens the manufacturing sector's capacity goes up industrials will also fall in line so today the situation is that some of this is already there in the share price and industrials which are a key part of small caps right uh, and infrastructure sector funds are already shown a bit of a rise because some of this uh, uh, jump in their order book and all has already been anticipated by the market but for the real order books to happen and that to happen you got to give it time so i would suggest that industrials are probably 12 to 18 months away from justifying the valuations that are there today but if you have a five year outlook then these valuations do not reflect the full potential of the industrial segment so timing is key if you have a 12 18 months they think they are fairly valued and the price already has the future discounted into it but from a longer term perspective they are good reasonable bets to uh, invest in the next question sir why is the ter of sumaram small cap higher than peers it is nothing to do we don't choose to set the tars it's the size of the fund which decides that so depending on the pr fund so if somebody has a 5000 crore small cap fund naturally the tr will less so say we operates a slab based tier based thing our fund is about 1000 odd crore so it is charging the tr that sebi allows us to charge so if the tr is not set by us it is set by a sebi formula of the fund size so as this fund size grows it has to first cross the 2000 crore barrier it's at about 1500 crores now so after it crosses the next 500 crores then the expense ratio will come down then when it crosses 5000 crores then the expense ratio will further come down so it's the fund size which decides that not the individual uh, choice the next one so what is the fair percentage combination of investments in large mid and small cap in equities as well as in mutual funds what is the Uh, fair percentage, fair, fair percentage fair combination. FAIR. Yes, sir. So it's based on the time. It depends on your uh, risk mentality. So it's a blend of the two. So I would say that if you take for a moderate risk person, or and you take a five-year time frame. So this is the middle of the pack, right? I would say. Uh, 50 30 20 50 50 large cap, cap, cap mid small for for this moderate risk appetite person for a five year outlook. The next one, sir. Uh, what are the options uh, for retire of investments for retired people, or uh, whether it's safe to do trading in stock? Not at all. So see, it it depends. When I say not at all, I'm talking about the fact that. are you going to trade in stocks like a race horse trading for the pleasure of trading yes please go ahead and do it if you're going to do it a limited portion of your corpus which is not going to affect your standard of living or your future needs go ahead and do it if you're going to what is the purpose of your investment sir you're spending your time and you want to do something learn and do something but ultimately you have to have a goal on your investment so if your goal is to leave a good corpus for your children and your grandchildren then equities investment is a good thing right whereas if you want to lead a comfortable existence for yourself then i would suggest that a more a balanced kind of an approach with an swp to meet your monthly expenditure needs is a better approach than going and trading so we've received a lot more questions than we can answer so in the interest of time we'll just take two more and okay. we'll leave the answers to the rest in the comments so the next question sir is we find that sensex is really high right now uh, could you suggest a level where one could enter to buy stocks or invest in mutual funds could we see sensex at 30000 again uh i think the sensex's level should not worry you because it reflects the eps growth so the sensex will keep on rising as the eps growth of indian companies goes on rising so the level of sensex should the valuation of the sensex are what you should worry about so can the sensex come down to 30000 it depends on whether the eps growth estimates are not achieved so far the indication is not like that eps growth estimates look like to be achieved second thing is that can indian market suddenly lose its charm for fiis so i believe that that would entail a huge correction for indian markets and i think that from today's level that kind of a correction is not warranted 
So I personally don't think that a level of thirty thousand of Sensex in the near future will be likely. So I would suggest that not to get worried about the levels of the Sensex. Uh, I think levels of Sensex will continuously rise over the medium term. But given the valuation perspective, taking a staggered approach to investing in the stock market is probably a more sensible strategy today. So next one, sir. Where do you see the AUM of Sundaram Mutual Fund in the next five years? Like in twenty thousand crores. That's my wish list. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, participants, for your overwhelming response. Um, Thank sir, you. Do stay safe and look forward to seeing you in the next question hour, next month.